One of our greatest enemies is a silent enemy. It's called fear. Fear. Its power lies not in its aggression, not in violence, not in sheer firepower, but in its silent, subtle ability to paralyze us. Insidious fear. What effects does fear have on your life? And what can we do to counter it? Being that it's not an overt enemy, you really can't feel its consequences. How many decisions do we not make? How many moves do we not take? How many elements in our lives would be different if fear was not holding us back? So first, identifying fear is so difficult, and then countering it. Especially in today's climate, in a world with so many unknowns and uncertainties, the volatility due to the wars taking place, due to the polarization, due to the ever-changing landscape, so many factors that are contributing to a certain unease, a disruption of norms, of things you can rely on. So when those constants are not in place, that only contributes to the fear level. So please join me in this very relevant and important conversation on how to overcome fear. Hi, this is Simon Jacobson, and we'll be speaking about how to overcome fear. This program is dedicated by Dawn Lynn Argue, in memory of Jasmine Argue. Fear, one of the most powerful enemies in our lives. Its power lies in its silence. It's not loud, it's not aggressive not violent, it doesn't attack you in an overt way, it just paralyzes you. It stops you from making a decision. It causes you to cower, to retreat. So it's so difficult to identify. Because it's one thing, if something comes to attack you, okay, that's the enemy, let me do what I have to do to defend myself. But if what creeps into our psyches is an element of fear, of uncertainty. Its effect is essentially in not allowing you to do something. And you may not know if it's coming from fear, is it coming from legitimate reasons, or it's something that you can't even identify. And yet fear plays a really powerful role in our lives. Do we even know what kind of effect it has? How many of your decisions, how many of your life choices, how many of your daily experiences is impacted by some form of fear? Fear of being rejected, fear of failure, fear of the unknown, legitimate fear for legitimate reasons or for imagined reasons. And especially when it comes to emotional decisions, making a commitment to someone, personal commitment, personal relationships, that's where fear really doesn't show its head, but it rears its ugly head in the form of 
indecisiveness. Not sure. When I'm not sure, it could really just mean fear. So better not to make a decision. However, especially important things in life, the greatest risk of all is not taking a risk. So it's not just, oh, play it safe. No, that itself could be the biggest problem. And you don't want fear controlling your life. You want to say no to something. You want to say yes, do so on its own merit. Not because you're afraid of the risk of the unknown uncertainty. Now, in today's climate, all this gets amplified. The volatility of our world today, the wars being fought, the uncertainties and disruptions and upheavals it creates, the polarization in the media and politics in so many areas of life, and all is broadcast and magnified by technology, social media, all contributes to more reasons for not making a move. The fear, the fear of the unknown, the fear of the known. So I would like to submit that if you can identify fear and then take actions that counter it, that teach you how to overcome it, it will change your life, transform your life, allow new opportunities to come your way that you would have never considered. Because it's so easy to just be on the, to be on the fence. Hey, you know, no decision. But how much are we losing out on? And it's you, your voice, your unique contributions that are remaining trapped because fear doesn't let you express it. The fear of failure, the fear of being rejected, the fear of risks, of unknowns. So let's cut to the chase. Let's try to get to the core of it. As always, you go back to the beginning, our childhoods. You can usually identify many of our psychological and emotional responses to life and what happened in our childhood. If you grew up in a home, in an environment where you were encouraged, where people believed in you, where risks were taken, and maybe sometimes you may have failed, but sometimes you succeeded, but you didn't shrink or cower or retreat in fear, there's no question that cultivates a sense of confidence to forge ahead and take on challenges. However, if you grew up in an environment where your parents, adults around you, in your formative years were fearful, and they made you be fearful by second-guessing you, criticizing, questioning, to the point of you saying, you know what, it's not worth it. I'll be laughed at, I'll be dismissed. Your children thrive on dreams, on imagination, on free abandon. When that in some way is encroached upon, what does it teach you to do? To curl up, to retreat, to not act. So many of our fears originate from those early years. That only makes it more difficult to deal with because it's deeply embedded, but it doesn't make it impossible. And it's vital to identify that. Pretty easy litmus test. And that is to look at decisions you make in your life. Next time you have to make an important decision about work, about home, about personal matters, see, ask yourself, what happens? How long do you procrastinate? Do you get frozen? Do you get trapped in the uncertainty of it all? Or are you able to make a quick decision? Not quick, but a firm decision. Do the research. Don't do anything hasty. We're not talking about doing something reckless. Do the research and see what happens. But if you did the research and you still remain trapped in the sense of not being able to make a move, you pretty much can identify that there's fear involved. 
So it's again, you don't see the fear, but you see its effects on you. Like a magnet behind the wall. Its effects will be felt even though you don't see the magnet. Now, one, one, one such incident is not yet proof enough. But if you see different choices you make and you see a constant pattern or a continuous pattern of repeated hesitation, you know this fear. Because you could always say maybe some situations objectively it's something that you're not ready to jump into. Fine, that's not a problem. But if you see it consistently, you know there's something there. But what's the point of knowing? Because awareness is half the cure. We shall, of course, talk about what to do about it. But identifying, because one of the things that fear does, it covers its tracks. It makes you feel, no, it's legitimate. It's not I'm afraid. There are legitimate reasons I'm staying away. But you have to be honest with yourself. And if it's indeed something that goes back to our childhoods and you can identify a cause, by all means, it will often need the help of an other party, someone more objective, someone that can step back and is not controlled by or affected by your fear or by your past and can help identify. So that always helps. But then comes step two, which is what do you do? Because in truth, based on what I've said before, if you, fear was not projected upon you and you didn't experience it from others, that's not what you naturally would gravitate to. Obviously, a healthy person is afraid of fire or danger. That's a healthy reaction and should be a, re a healthy reflexive reaction. But we're talking about decisions. We're talking about emotional vulnerability. We're talking about things where you should be moving forward. So the fact that there are factors that caused you to be at fear, meaning if you didn't have those factors, you naturally would have moved forward. Look at little young children when they start crawling or they start walking. They may have a little fear that's unknown, but you see how easily they overcome the fear. But if you scare them and say, don't stand up, you may fall. And you keep threatening them or you make them feel uncomfortable or in danger, then of course you're just going to feed into those fears. But if you leave them be, and more than that, you encourage, a child will walk up and even if they fall once or twice or more times. So in other words, we have in us the capacity to experiment even at the risk of not always making it and learning, from the job, learning on the job, learning through the experience. So then what, what do we do? We have to figure out how to not allow those voices to affect you. So sometimes the approach has to be, don't get emotionally connected to it. Even if you do it behaviorally, you already made a move. Sometimes you just have to make the move. And the emotions will follow. Someone will say, nah, I'm not going to try this until I feel, until it resonates with me. There are times that definitely is helpful. But because fear can be a factor, sometimes acting I'm not in the mood right now to go volunteer and help uh, some special children, needy children. Go anyway. See, see what happens. When you do it, how, well, how good you feel about yourself. You've helped some other people. It enriches your life. That's how you overcome fears, by actions. Because action is a powerful move. It's not theory. It's not philosophizing. It's not sitting around. Let me think it through from every angle. So, Find, identify, and find things in your life that you're ready to act on, even if you're not in the mood, even if you have reasons not to do it. Maybe I won't be that good, but bottom line is you're helping someone. You learn. You'll be, become better. So the first step is leap, taking a leap, jumping in and doing something positive. And if it's a positive thing, what have you lost? Even if someone can do it better than you, so? But you've done it. And that's how you discover that you're good at it and become better at it. So that's number one. Fear's power is paralyzing. It's fear's power is to debilitate, to demoralize, to make you feel you can't do it and basically get you into a place where no action is done. So what's the counter to that action? Do an action. If it comes with too much resistance, so choose a different area. Choose a field, an area where it's easier for you to act, but act. 
The last thing you want to do is lie in bed and, and just, in your mind, go through all the motions and all the fears just feed upon each other. Action is a tremendous force in life. Tremendous power that can help you reach places you can't imagine. There are many times I feel like stuck. Writer's block. For whatever reason, you're not so motivated. But the commitment that I know that I have to do something, either there's a deadline or people are waiting for me or there's other pressures, that pulls, that, that in a sense tugs at, I know what the word I'm using for. It pulls you out of the rut. A commitment with another. Don't underestimate these powers. And in general, when you work with another person, a friend, you do something with another, it also gives you strength because that person empowers you and you empower them. The next point. Fear is very much associated with insecurity. And there are many things in life that make, you, that make us insecure. People, broken promises, shattered dreams, betrayals, disloyalty, people hurting us, all this contributes to an insecure sense of things. So of course you're going to be fearful. Maybe the next person will disappoint you as well, will betray, will hurt, will violate. So one option is you just put up a wall, thick layers of armor that don't let you get hurt by anybody. But then you're not going to have relationships because no one can get in, but no one can get out either. That's not the approach. The approach is how do you build security? when you've grown up or you are feeling insecurity, insecure world around you. So often many of us turn to, I always find it ironic, it's called securities, financial securities, the prudential rock, as if it will give you absolute security. Money is the last thing that gives you security because money constantly is moving and changing and you can always lose it. The only foundations that give you security are foundations that are unwavering. So where do you find unwavering power? So being that terrorism is in the news, unfortunately. So I remember the class I gave years ago. One of the first early terrorist attacks in Jerusalem was on a Friday in a cafe. Someone left a suicide bomber, left a bomb in a, in a suitcase, put it near a, a leg of a table in a cafe. It exploded. I think there were a lot of casualties. There was one woman who was there, an American woman. <coughs> and I'll tell you in a moment how I know the story from her. Who came to see a friend, a, a meet a friend for coffee er, early Friday afternoon. In Jerusalem. I think it was Ben Yehuda. And unfortunately, she was there. So she wasn't killed, but she was, her face was severely damaged, lost her hearing, her smell. Didn't need a lot of plastic surgery to rebuild. She came to a class that I gave in Manhattan, Upper West Side. And I remember at the end of the class, she came over to me with a friend of hers, introduced herself. As she got closer, she had a beautiful face, but she got closer, I saw that it was definitely worked upon, lack of a better word. And I don't say that in any, I say it with pain, and I'm glad she was able to regain her dignity. But listen to this. She shares with me that she was a student. She was in America, grew up in a secular home, and decided to go study, but she couldn't tell her parents because they would never agree to go study in a yeshiva coming from a secular background. So she said she's going on a trip to the Middle East. She didn't lie. She didn't say Israel. She said Middle East. Anyway, she ends up there studying, and then that Friday... She ends up in a hospital without hearing, without a face, almost. And literally saying to herself, why am I here? Her parents found out about it from a picture on CNN, I think. They see her covered in blood. And they realized she was there. So they came flying to, 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 uh, to Israel. Obviously, they did not come with complaints. But, but she was crying out to God. She says, why? I came here to study your Torah. I come, came here to connect to you. This is what you do to me? You might as well take my life. You've taken everything from me. My looks, 
my, my senses, my functionality. She's extremely angry. And this went on for months, and she said the pain, as the nerves started reconnecting, re, re, uh, she really wanted her life to end. And one morning she woke up, the sun was shining through the window, that's how she told it to me. Bright sun in her face, a warm sun. And suddenly she had a surge, a surge of willpower, of strength, of courage. No, I'm going to fight. I'm going to survive this. I'm going to rebuild my life. And these are, the words, these are the words she said to me. You don't know how strong faith and trust are until you're left with nothing but them. You don't know how strong faith is until you have nothing but faith, nothing but trust. And her faith and trust in God gave her the strength. You know, of course, I was extremely moved and taken by this. And it captured the theme that true security is not going to come from human beings, and it's not going to come from man-made objects, and it's not going to come from anything that's temporary and mortal and impermanent. It's going to come from eternal values. To use the expression from Rab Meir of Permishlan, when you're tied above, you don't fall below. That even if you're walking on the slippery slopes of life, but when you have a rope, in this case a figurative rope, because you're holding on to something that's greater than the slopes and greater than the physical world, that gives you an immortal strength and allows you to overcome the insecurities, the fears of the unknowns of the slippery slopes of life. So that brings us to the second component here. It's not really a second, it's a deeper dimension that it's critical. The counter fear doesn't happen automatically. It's to build a security with something that is transcends and is more powerful from where those, than where those fears come from. To know no matter what happens in life, even the unknowns, even the things that we are afraid of because we don't know what's coming, but you're holding on to something that's greater than that. Your very existence, your purpose in life that you're here for a reason. And even the challenges of your life are also for a reason. You hold on to that with your dear life, that gives you security, that gives you strength. It doesn't allow fear to control your life. The more you're connected and attached, this is how the formula goes, to material things, to things that are not permanent, that are wavering, that are ever-shifting, the more fear you'll have. The more you connect to the eternal, and to the immortal, and to values that go beyond the here and now, the less fear you'll have. Try it out. So it's a, time, it's a time, especially in times like this, to write down for yourself, what are the things I absolutely believe in? What are the things I absolutely hold on to? What are those real rocks, the real foundational principles that I'm ready to fight for, that I know are unwavering, that I know will never change? That's what you need to hold on to. That's what counters the ever-shifting vicissitudes and changes all around us. Those changes can be overwhelming because they're constantly moving and like a moving target, how do you, you, what do you hold on to? Whereas these foundational principles, the things you really believe in, is starting with your mission in life starting with your values, your standards, the love in your life, the people in your life. The more you build that up, the more power you have to counter fears. That doesn't mean fears disappear automatically, but you have an arsenal that you're building because that's what it comes down to, which is point number three. You need to build up and reinforce your resources, which comes because you've been given and blessed with those resources, and you're acting, point number one, those three combinations of acting and not just waiting until you're in the mood of it. Two, to connect, to, to be tied above, bound above. And three, that you're building up an arsenal. It's not a one-time thing. You're constantly building resources, hopefully upon the resources you had in the past. 
That creates the confidence. That creates, you can say, the platform that gives you the power to launch and be proactive and not reactive, which is, of course, a feature of fear, reactive. Proactive is the opposite of fear. Leaders are proactive. They lead. They take a risk. They take a calculated risk. So you see this in any. Let's take a military campaign. What's the first thing the military does? They establish a base, a secure base, upon which they can build upon. Take away the base. They're not going to, you can't just fight. You have to have a base. You have to have a home base. You have to have where to return to. You have to build your platforms. And that's the resources we build in our lives. The things we do that are consistent with what we believe in. That every day be charitable, be generous, be kind, be gracious, show gratitude. These things build and reinforce your spiritual arsenal that will counter any of the fears that may come your way. So fear like darkness is the absence of strength, absence of light. Darkness is the absence of light. Fear is the absence of confidence. It's not a force of its own. You bring in confidence, fear automatically gets dispelled. So find the things that you believe in and fight for them. And you'll see how fear dissipates. Having friends, having support system, obviously is critical. Because we're still humans, and fears can creep in. Don't be afraid that fears will come your way. As I said, it's not a magic pill, but this is the formula of how to build. And we've seen, time-tested, people who have built these Resources, these strengths, have been bound above, have acted on it, are the ones that have achieved tremendous things. Not because they have no fears, because they did not let the fears define them. They did not let the fears control them. In our times, we need this message more than ever. Because there's so many messages being streamed, beamed, inundating us. And confusing messages. And confusing messages thus just... Throw us off balance. Who do you believe? What's true? That's why it's vital to go back to those fundamental truths of your life. And do so with your children, with your friends, with your families, with your colleagues. You'd be surprised if you have people come together. Let, let them write down. What are the things that are unwavering? What are the things you're ready to fight for? The things you know for sure? The things you can hold on to securely? No matter what happens, this will be there for you. When you see people do this with each other, always surprises. We just don't do it enough. Whatever reason, we're distracted, we take it for granted, we underestimate its importance. And that's where fear grows, in the vacuum, in the lack of that tremendous focus that gives us the strength, the confidence, the fortitude, the courage. And as I said, today more than ever. This has been Simon Jacobson, How to Overcome Fear. I hope this was helpful to you. If it was, please share with others. Please subscribe to our growing YouTube channel. Love to hear your thoughts, feedback, comments, suggestions. And please check us out at MeaningfulLife.com. We have this and many other programs that cover personal, psychological, emotional issues, spiritual issues across the entire spectrum of life. Be blessed. Be strong, confident, and remember, you have within you that unique, indispensable soul that you can build confidence upon and all the strength that you need to overcome any of the challenges and the unknowns and fears in our lives. Thank you so much. Be well. This program is brought to you by the Meaningful Life Center. Please help us continue our programs. Make even a small contribution at MeaningfulLife.com slash donate.